previously in Rio. Um, let me introduce myself. My name is Anred Esterhuisen. I'm from Association for Progressive Communication. And we are Excellent. one of the partners that have been exploring this notion of how we can make a positive contribution to internet governance through looking at the possibility of, of improved and possibly common practices in the area of access to information about internet governance, participation in inter internet governance processes, and transparency. And our other two partners in this initiative is, and I have on my right, Hans Hansel from United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. And sadly, Council of Europe, the third partner in this initiative, is not with us. Um, but we do have an opening address, which we're going to try and play to you, from Maud de Boer, um, Deputy Secretary General of Council of Europe. And um, once we've listened to that, we'll go ahead with the rest of our panel. I hope we are not the largest panel in the IGF this year. We're certainly smaller than many of the IGF panels in Rio, but don't be intimidated by the size of the panel. Um, Paul, can you try and play that for us? Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. However, it does not in any way change the commitment of the Council of Europe to the IGF process. Let me start by welcoming you all to this workshop on a code of good practice on public participation in internet governance. It is very good to see that the joint initiative by UNIC, the Council of Europe and APC has maintained and even increased its momentum since the good practice forum that was organized last year in Rio. We have a wide range of diverse experience with principles of information and participation in internet governance. There is therefore a good case for investigating whether it might be possible to develop common principles by drawing on existing experience and on best practice in governance in other policy fields. The Aarhus Convention can readily be considered best practice outside internet governance for this purpose. If we talk about re regulatory action in the present context, it is quite obvious that there is little scope to develop a binding legal instrument on public participation in internet governance. Like others at the Council of Europe, we are increasingly convinced that instruments of soft law are to be preferred. Ladies and gentlemen, without preempting your discussions this afternoon, I think that it would be very interesting to compare existing arrangements for information, transparency, and public participation in some of the key entities of internet governance. I would therefore be very pleased to see emerge from this meeting an initial agreement by some key internet governance stakeholders to be available for further discussions. One way of taking the work forward could be an attempt to map and compare the existing arrangements for information, transparency, and public participation in different entities. I'm convinced that this initiative can contribute to bringing together people, technology, and democratic participation in the field of internet governance. I wish you very fruitful discussions and thank you for your attention. We can go ahead with, with, with our workshop. Um, to give you a, a description of what we'll do, and um, please remember that in spite of the formal setting, we want to keep it very informal and interactive. First, we'll have two speakers who will frame for us um, what we are talking about. Bill Drake, who will we'll, um, discuss on the bill, just identify yourself please, who will give us some general principles on, on, of past participation and some background on global internet governance. Then we have David Suter sitting next to Bill. David has been involved in this initiative from quite early on and has done some research and scoping of what it is that we're talking about when we, we're talking about this code of, of good practice. And um, and he'll give you an introduction of, of what it is we're trying to do, what we've achieved so far, and where we're heading. And 
what, what is very significant for, for the three partners of today's workshop is that we've invited internet governance institutions, stakeholders as well as governance institutions, to get their perspective on what they feel is the state of transparency, participation, and access um, to information in this field. And um, we have speakers from ISOC, from ICANN, and from Asia Pacific Network Information Center. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves, um, and, but we'll do that when we get to the, the second round of the, of the meeting. Um, and we'll keep that part very interactive. But let's proceed immediately with the background. Bill, can you start, please? Thank you, Henriette, and hello, everybody. Uh, let me start my timer here. Um, I was asked to, to talk about the WISIS principles as a sort of uh, starting point for uh, discussion about uh, the adoption of a, or design and potential adoption of a code of good practice, um, drawing also on the Aarhus Convention, and to do so in seven minutes precisely. So I'll do my best to stick within the parameters. Um, I think this is a really important initiative. It's an effort to systematize and extend to internet governance standards of good governance which have been much debated in other national and international arenas uh, in response to a real need, I think, to both increase the functional performance of internet governance mechanisms and expand the level of political buy-in among all stakeholders. So it also s serves, I think, to bridge the gaps between internet governance and other areas of global governance where these kinds of issues, accountability, transparency, and so on, have been much debated. Um, at the same time, it clearly faces some challenges going forward. Analy analytically, there are a number of challenges in thinking about how to frame such a code, particularly given the great variations across governance mechanisms and the extent to which they uh, are transparent and inclusively participatory, and the, in light of the local traditions that evolve, evolved within each of these institutions. Um, and there's often a kind of a disjuncture also between the formal mechanisms of transparency and inclusion and the informal realities of how uh, different institutions work, and that has to be taken on board. And politically, I think there's the possibility of some resistance to such an initiative on turf grounds and so on by some organizations that may not prefer to be um, analyzed and assessed and subject to any external sort of uh, notions of how they should be operating. So these are things that I think will be encountered. But if handled right, I think they should be tractable. And uh, it has been the case thus far, usually speaking, that procedural types of issues uh, addressed in the context of WISIS, the IGF, and so on, usually have lent themselves to more ready agreement than a lot of the individual substantive issues. It's hard for people to really argue in principle against doing things in a, in a fair and open way. Um, against good governance. It's not, it's not a real winning position to get up and say, I'm opposed to good governance. So, and governments did, after all, uh, repeatedly throughout the WISIS process, endorse principles of good governance, which I'll be mentioning in a second. And so, in light of that, I would think that we could build on that and leverage it. And I also think that the IGF is perfectly suited to being the kind of place where you, this kind of uh, activity can be taken forward. From the early, earliest conceptions of the IGF, the IGF was supposed to be uh, attuned to being able to address horizontal and holistic issues that cut across different governance mechanisms. Um, and uh, that's reflected, in fact, in the mandate of the IGF that was given uh, first in the WIGIG report and later in the Tunis de Declaration that called for the IGF to promote and assess on an ongoing basis the embodiment of WISIS principles in internet governance processes. Uh, unfortunately, as it's currently constructed as a kind of annual conference, the IGF doesn't really have the institutional capacity to, to do something like that, to uh, monitor on an ongoing basis and so on and assess. But it can provide a facilitative environment in which the concerned parties can take such an initiative and raise awareness and share results. So just briefly, the WISIS principles, if you remember, um, way back to 2003, the Latin American and Caribbean Regional Conference held in Bavaro adopted a declaration um, that included some language which was later brought in to the WISIS process and eventually became uh, embodied in the Declaration of Principles adopted in Geneva in 2003. Paragraph 48 of that agreement establishes 
that uh, internet governance should be multilateral, transparent, and democratic, with the full involvement of governments, the private sector, civil society, and international organizations. The latter point uh, is amplified further in paragraph 49 that says that internet governance should involve all stakeholders and relevant intergovernmental and international organizations. Going further, the, the declaration held that internet governance should be addressed in a coordinated manner. Taken together, these are sort of the procedural component of the WISIS principles. There was also a substantive component that dealt with the notions that internet governance should, be, should ensure an equitable distribution of resources, facilitate access for all, and ensure a stable and secure functioning of the internet, taking into account multilingualism. So these procedural elements then are something that I think uh, were routinely uh, repeated by governments and then also uh, folded into the Tunis agenda and as I said before, made part of the mandate of the IGF. So how do we begin to build on these WISIS principles and take them forward in the context of this initiative? First, I would suggest that we need to have some clarification of the relevant principles and uh, uh, that might be brought into a code. If you look at some of the terms that are used in the WISIS principles, like uh, multilateral, democratic, and so on, these become a little bit difficult to actually nail down precisely what they may mean. And in some cases, they may not be applicable. Uh, it, it's kind of nonsensical, for exa example, to suggest that all internet governance should be multilateral, since multilateral means intergovernmental, and much of what goes on in the internet governance space is private sector and multi-stakeholder. So it couldn't be something that you could just turn into a multilateral framework. And indeed, multilateralism could be viewed as contradictory with multi-stakeholderism. So I, I would prefer to just extract from those principles the two key points, the ones that are really relevant to this initiative, transparency and inclusive full participation. Um, these terms need to be defined and operationalized in terms of, ooh, I have one minute left. Um, in terms of, okay, stop that. <laughs> in terms of uh, some illustrative measures or actions and their interrelationships so that we can get our heads around precisely what do we mean by these terms. Then we need to clarify the domain of their application by mapping the internet governance mechanisms. And there's a wide variety of mechanisms, including mechanisms that are not um, about um, international agreements, either private or, or public sector. A lot of internet governance, for example, really is um, essentially unilateral actions taken by powerful national governments that are essentially expanded internationally uh, through extraterritorial application. There's also cases where essentially governments all converge on a certain kind of policy framework or uh, mutually recognize each other's policy frameworks so that you get a level of harmonization that's similar to what you might have through an actual cooperative agreement. And the question, of course, becomes, can you think about applying these kinds of principles in those difficult kinds of cases? Then we need to surface and aggregate the information on the existing practices among those different institutions that we've selected, spell out how they address these issues, and then take that information and go back and sort of adapt uh, a draft framework that's responsive to that variation, and then enter into discussion with some key organizations about endorsing and applying the, the, uh, the framework. And I would say, you know, start small, uh, get a few main players on board, use the power of attraction, the fact that some others are already embracing these things and holding themselves up as models of good practice, et cetera, and hope that you can then build momentum and draw others into it. And going forward to conclude, I think, you know, we just need to do uh, some analytical work, uh, which could involve case studies uh, of the different uh, institutions and how they instantiate these different principles, uh, comparative analysis and holistic analysis, and then also uh, perhaps build some sort of a mechanism to get uh, people mobilized behind this, whether a dynamic coalition in the IGF or some other mechanism, so that the issue sort of stays live within the IGF and is carried forward by the various parties. Um, so that's just my initial gloss on some of the background conditions with respect to the WISIS principles and ways you can build out from them towards uh, an effort to establish a code. Thank you, and I turn it over to David. Do present the, um, the content of the background paper which I drafted for the Council of Europe, UNEC, and uh, APC on this area. So that's, uh, I'll be 
I'll stick to that um, uh, pre fairly precisely. Uh, the aim of the background paper was to look at some ideas which those three organizations have been developing over some years, um, and uh, it's possible to encapsulate those ideas in uh, a three-point proposition, uh, and I'll quote that proposition from the paper. The first point in it is that uh, the quality and inclusiveness of internet governance would be improved by steps to make information about decision-making processes and practice more open and more widely available, and to facilitate more effective participation by more stakeholders. Quite a few points in that particular point. The second uh, point is that ways of achieving this might be encapsulated in a code of good practice, which would be concerned with information, participation, and governance. And the third point is that a code of good practice, if one were developed, should be based on the WUSIS principles and on existing practice in internet governance bodies. And it might also draw on the experience of developing and implementing information and participation within the Aarhus Convention, which I'll say something about later. Now, some background points are needed here, and they draw a bit on things that Bill has already said. Firstly, what do we mean by a code of practice or a code of good practice? Uh, we don't mean here something that is prescriptive. Not so we don't mean something that will tell organizations what they should do. Um, insofar as this investigation, this initiative is concerned, what a code of practice really means is firstly a benchmark, something that's built on existing experience in the internet world and beyond the internet world, which allows for comparison between the practices and, and performance of different organizations. And it's also um, something that means a, a frame of reference which different organizations might find useful uh, in developing and adapting their existing processes as they have to do because of the continual change in the internet and the environment surrounding the internet. So that's the, what we would mean by a code of practice. What do we mean by internet governance here? Uh, because again, there are many ways of defining that and I, I don't have time to go into them in detail, but in brief, I'd say um, two or three points here. Firstly, that the organizations in this initiative are concerned both with narrow internet governance and broad internet governance. By narrow, I mean governance in areas which are largely concerned with the functioning of the internet itself uh, by broad, I mean governance in areas where the internet intersects with <coughs> other aspects of public policy and other, other kinds of governance in the world outside and beyond the internet. For example, trade and tax, intellectual property, uh, privacy, security, and so forth. Secondly, uh, I think it's clear that we're, we're concerned, uh, and this results from that first point, it's clear that we're concerned with governance that's undertaken by entities which are specific and exclusive to the internet, like most of the, those on this table here, uh, and also with governance which is led by more conventional uh, governance regimes um, and agencies whose responsibilities lie primarily outside the internet rather than within it. Uh, and thirdly, um, I think it's, uh, it's clear that we're concerned not just with laws, standards, uh, rules, regulations, other, other kind of hard forms of um, of governance. We're also concerned with norms and conventions and, for that matter, program code with the softer areas of, of governance uh, which affect the way that the internet itself develops and which affect the way in which the internet interacts with society and economy and culture and, and, and politics. And in addition to that, we're concerned about the processes um, as well as the outcomes, uh, so the, the processes by which hard laws and soft norms are developed and implemented. So that's what we, we kind of trying to mean here. Now, internet governance, as, as we know and as Bill has, has described, is highly distributed and highly diverse. There are very many organizations involved. They have very different uh, characteristics, very different styles and methodologies. Um, they range from associations of individuals to organizations that are part of the UN family. Uh, and therefore highly intergovernmental. Uh, each of them has different processes which works for it. Um, uh, at least we hope, and it hopes, that they work for it. Um, and which draws on the experience and expertise of the stakeholders within it. And there are good reasons why organizations do things the way they do, usually. Um, uh, and there's, that's a fundamental starting point for any discussion about this. So why, in that case, is it important to compare different approaches of different organizations and, and see whether there is a case for developing a code of a good practice. Um, here I think there are three points that I draw attention to. First is the, the growing importance of the internet. 
as the internet becomes more and more important in society, economy, culture, and politics, um, it becomes more significant to wider groups of stakeholders. A lot of issues which appear to some to be highly technical and internal to the internet appear to others to have substantial public policy impacts in areas like access promotion, like development, like environmental sustainability, like the relationship between the citizen and the state. Now these impacts need to be known to and understood by those who are making decisions that may lead to them. The second point follows from this, and it's the growing importance of the interaction between narrow internet governance, that's concerned with the internet per se and handled largely by internet specific bodies, the, inter the interaction between that form of governance and broad internet governance, which is concerned about the impact which the internet has in other spheres, and which is largely handled by bodies which are external to the internet. Now the cultures of these two area, two types of governance body are often very different. In particular, within the internet space, um, uh, the ethos of governance is often highly experimental, whereas in conventional governance, it's often based around a precautionary principle that the key factor is to ensure that, uh, is to minimize potential harm. Um, these different cultures need to understand one another effectively and to work together in, in those areas where these interactions are increasingly important. And the third point I'd make here is the pace of change that we're experiencing. Um, the internet changes very fast. Um, and as a result of that, the effectiveness of existing governance arrangements is likely to require adaptation to the changing set of circumstances. Organizations that need to adapt to change need to look at how other organizations do things and see what can be learned from that and where there might be synergies and, and benefits uh, from uh, adapting their own processes and their interactions with those other agencies. So there are two starting points uh, for the proposition, uh, which I read out to you earlier, the WUSIS principles and the Office convention. Uh, Bill's talked about the WUSIS principles, and I don't really need to do so again, other than to say that the organizations behind this initiative think it is possible to build a more substantial shared understanding of what they might imply, and also that it would be worthwhile to do that. I should say a bit more about the Aarhus Convention, um, because that's probably not familiar to, to most people here. Um, it's, uh, and it's not necessarily central to what we're talking about, but it's a good example of something that's relevant. Um, the Aarhus Convention is uh, a UN ECE convention which sets out rights to information and participation in uh, environmental decision making. Those rights um, are relevant to citizens, to businesses, to civil society organizations, and to others. Uh, and they apply within member countries of UNECE, which it covers Europe, North America, and parts of Central Asia. Now, we're not, nobody here is suggesting that this provides a template for internet governance. For a start, it's an intergovernmental convention about uh, binding governments to act in particular ways. And that's obviously very different from internet governance. But there are two ways in which it is, I think, useful, um, and which we think it is useful in the paper. First, it sets out some basic principles about openness, inclusiveness, and transparency in information and participation. And they may also have relevance in other sectors. Secondly, it's at present the furthest that an intergovernmental organization has gone towards entrenching rights and responsibilities concerning information and participation within uh, intergovernmental governance. Uh, so it's a, it's a kind of the frontier, if you like, of, uh, of governmental um, policy in this area. So my time will be nearly up. Um, I need to say something about how the paper proposes and the three organizations propose we might go forward. Um, the paper's really an invitation to explore issues. It's, it doesn't go beyond that. It doesn't seek to provide, uh, to offer solutions. It's an, it's an invitation to the internet community to explore issues. Um, there are obviously very good reasons for diversity in governance arrangements, and uh, those are to be welcomed. Um, uh, and, and in fact, I, I think I'd say that probably the organizations involved here would say that there's uh, a great deal that internet governance bodies can learn from each other's diversity and that non-internet governance bodies can learn from the diversity of internet governance bodies. Um, the case for 
I'd say giving the WUSIS principles more solidity and for thinking about the possibility of a code of good practice rests on three propositions, and here again I'll quote. Uh, first, it would give the in internet governance processes and decisions more credibility and legitimacy in the eyes of important stakeholder groups. I'd add here, not least those that are newly engaging with, in with the internet as it broadens its social impact. Uh, second, it would help different internet governance bodies to coordinate their work, make decision making more consistent, avoid conflicts between them, uh, and ensure synergies were realized. And third, it could improve the quality of decision making by involving a wider range of expertise, experience, and views. Clearly, it's important to sustain the dynamism and vitality of the internet uh, and, uh, and innovation. And clearly, nothing constructive in this area is going to be achieved without the consent of those engaged. And that's why we're very much uh, talking here about building on the foundation of existing arrangements and achievements of internet governance bodies. There are two modest short-term proposals made at the end of the paper. First is to undertake a mapping exercise of information and participation arrangements currently adopted by internet governance agencies. So looking in detail at how they consult stakeholders, provide information, enable participation, engage with the wider world, including one another. Uh, and the aim of that would be to establish a better base for comparing practice between agencies and understanding what's most effective in what context. And the second um, modest proposal is to provide the basis of, for um, a more substantive exploration of, of the opportunities here by working together. Uh, so by developing a discourse involving the proposers of this initiative uh, and a number of internet governance bodies ahead of the next IGF. Uh, so we'd look at the results of a mapping exercise, the views of internet governance bodies themselves, and perhaps also a non-internet experience like the Aarhus Convention. So that's the summary of the paper, which I hope hasn't gone too far over time. And uh, we now move on to the much more um, open part of the, the session. Thanks. The is available on the IGF website. You simply click on the workshop URL um, from the program, and you'll be able to access it um, from the workshop page. Um, now I'd like to ask um, our panel of stakeholders to introduce themselves and, and also to explain or, or to tell us which institution or which process and what type of governance institution they work in. And then I'll ask them a few questions. Thomas, can we start with you? Ofcom, which is the Swiss Federal Office of Communications. We are the regulator for electronic media and telecommunication, uh, the telecom market. Um, I'm also quite involved in the work of the Council of Europe with regard to human rights in information society uh, uh, and also with regard to internet governance. And um, well, I have, I have uh, uh, being a Swiss and coming from a country which is very federalistic and has uh, the instrument of direct democracy, I have some experience in, in, in uh, participation and transparency and accountability issues that might be interesting. Thanks, Thanks Thomas. About a year now, uh, I worked for many years in the Canadian government uh, in the telecommunications realm. I was uh, Canadian policy lead on our inputs to the WISIS, and uh, Canada was very proud of there of being one of the first governments, if not the first, to uh, incorporate civil society into our delegation, uh, which I think was very positive for, for the WISIS process. Also involved in many other organizations, uh, both uh, multilateral, such as the ITU, down to the regional organizations like CETEL in uh, in the Americas, and non-treaty organizations like APEX. So I've had a, a broad view of the governmental side. Um, in ISOC, I'm in charge of what's called strategic global engagement, and that's uh, precisely related to uh, ISOC's involvement with these intergovernmental organizations and with other organizations in the internet space and in civil society. So this is uh, a lot of, this is very, very interesting to me. Just to conclude very briefly, the internet society is a not-for-profit based in uh, uh, Switzerland and the United States, but with people all over the world, and we're a cause-based organization dedicated to the good of 
the answer of the reasons why not our uh, Vice President Global Strategic Partnership should have been here uh, and that then who might probably join a bit later but should have been detained in another meeting. Um, our department is like more or less the one with ISO uh, engaged in promoting participation from the widest possible range of stakeholders as one of the central um, component in the ISO model is exactly make sure that every decision is taken on the basis of the participative process that is essentially bottom up. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks and, uh, uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Wilson. I'm the head of APNIC, the Asia Pacific Network Information Centre, which is the regional IP address registry for the Asia Pacific. So we are responsible for the allocation and registration of IPv4 and IPv6 address layers and related resources in this region. Uh, I also uh, happen to be this year the, the chair of the Number Resource Organisation, which is a coalition, an umbrella group, uh, more or less, for the five regional internet registries which uh, collectively uh, carry out this responsibility uh, globally. Uh, so uh, these, uh, a few words on the regional internet registries and the, and the system within which we operate. Uh, we've been uh, running now for, uh, collectively, for more than 15 years and have been involved through that time in, in a continual process of, uh, of what would be conventionally industry self-regulation uh, using bottom-up uh, processes open to all of our stakeholders in the uh, development of the, as we call them, policies, but these are, these are procedures and rules by which, um, by which IP addresses primarily are being, are being allocated. So we have got very well uh, established but also uh, continually evolving uh, mechanisms for decision making, for policy development, for participation in those processes, and uh, and so I'm here uh, with uh, in the capacity uh, representing those organisations, and and I'm able to to talk in so at some length uh, during the uh, subsequent questions about how um, how we go about these things. Thanks. Um, thank you, Paul. And, and just to clarify, I, 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 um, I, I think for us the, the particular collection of institutions that we have on the panel at the moment um, do not, the intention is not that they represent the sum of, of institutions that we'd like to work with. There clearly are many more and, and there's the ITU, there are national level bodies. So really consider this just as a, as a starting point and we're very grateful that they're here. The first question that, that I want to address to, to, um, to um, members of the panel, um, not reflecting necessarily on your own institution, but if you were to give a broad sort of, of, of almost a gut response on the state of transparency, access to information and opportunities for participation and in internet governance, do you think it's sufficient? Do you, do you think there is a, you know, is, is, this, is this task a needed task? How would you, how would you, um, describe the current status of access to information and, and, and transparency, opportunities to participate in internet governance, and what would you say at a very general level are the primary challenges? Any volunteer, who wants to start? And keep your responses very brief, please. I'd say that it's highly variable. Um, if you look across uh, the different settings, you find very different patterns. If you're talking about intergovernmental organizations, many of those are fairly transparent uh, in terms of making documents available subject to certain restrictions, etc. Although there are some key international organizations, such as the ITU, where the documents are only available to members who pay dues and so on, uh, generally speaking. With some exceptions, they've uh, made technical standards of some sorts freely available now. Um, uh, then you have uh, cases uh, of, uh, with regard to participation where, again, some organizations are more uh, facilitative and open than others in the intergovernmental sphere. And again, ITU, which generally has not uh, opened the door to civil society, stands as a kind of funny uh, outlier in relation to other members of the UN family. In the private sector or multi-stakeholder settings, you often have less formal kinds of restrictions. Uh, anybody can join to participate in uh, ICANN, for example, but there are some informal barriers that people encounter, cultural, knowledge, uh, so on. It's, you know, you find yourself thrown into a 
process that's been ongoing with uh, arguments that have been going on for years among people in a certain kind of style of decision making that I think for some parties, particularly people from developing countries, that might be rather difficult to figure out how to position themselves. Then you have uh, internet governance mechanisms that really are not uh, very transparent or inclusive at all. Um, when you have, as I said, uh, cases where large uh, and powerful countries make unilateral decisions through their legislatures or courts or regulatory bodies that essentially are applied transnationally, well, you know, that's, there's no real possibility there for, you know, foreign parties, et cetera, to really be a party to the discussions. So again, I, it really depends on which context we're talking about. I think probably the private sector governance mechanisms, purely private sector governance mechanisms, present the biggest challenge because you know, when you have businesses, industry associations, for example, uh, setting policies, um, they're geared towards working with other firms, period. And sometimes there's issues of proprietary information and so on involved in their actions. Any reaction to Observation on this. I think that the question of access to information in the internet governance and more generally in the internet sphere um, comes from a basic um, question that the internet was uh, 20, 25 years ago, a very specific um, scientific application that was used by a very homogeneous community, the scientific, the research community, and in a relatively short period of time it has become a pervasive instrument for the rest of society, which has created a, a lot of expectation from society about having uh, the possibility to access the information that are at the basis of the choices that are made regarding this, this instrument. And this creates, I think, one of the basic challenges for all those that are involved in what has been described as the narrow governance, so the governance that is directly related to the internet uh, functioning, to let um, other parts of society that come not from a technical background to meaningfully participate in uh, designing the instrument that will then be used uh, in so many different instances of social life. Well, Graham, and, and Tom, Bill and then Thomas. Thanks. Uh, I'd agree with Bill that there's a huge range here, and uh, I really think that's an evolutionary question. Uh, I mean, the Internet in its early development de developed its own uh, mechanisms of governance that suited where it was at the time. Those institutions, uh, I think uh, Bill called them experimental. They, I would call them more evolutionary. They've evolved uh, with the Internet as it's, uh, as it's matured and as its influence has spread. A lot of the more traditional governance mechanisms like the, uh, the international, uh, but even national government uh, organizations are now moving into the internet space and bringing with them a lot of practices and presumptions that worked very well pre-internet but aren't really that applicable in, uh, in the internet space. And the final thing I'd, I'd say is that while uh, many of the internet organizations uh, are moving to try to to react uh, more openly and uh, more fully with the uh, traditional forms of gov governance. Uh, that outreach tends to be much more one way. Uh, you don't find a lot of governments moving uh, actively into the internet institutions to try to engage on that ground. They tend to prefer to stay in their own sandbox and either invite you in or not, depending on the nature of the individual institution. Thomas. Thank you. Um, uh, basically, I would say that in, in all these uh, entities, uh, uh, transparency and participation can be improved uh, and, and should be improved. Um, and and uh, apart from the, the formal barriers that there are, that there are already different in, in, in those different entities, I think there are some similarities with informal and structural barriers. So, for instance, uh, uh, I participate uh, in, in, in ITU's work, in, in, in uh, uh, UNESCO work at the Council of Europe, in other fora. Uh, I, I, uh, I participated in some of the ICANN uh, GAC meetings and so on. <coughs> and 
no matter which one of those, it, it's, it's not that easy to access, to find out where, the, what kind of decisions are taken, where the important decisions are taken. So, I mean, if, if you take ICANN, this is quite a complex structure with all the sub uh, bodies and so on, and ITU with all the subgroups, and they talk about study group 17 of ITT, blah, 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 and things like that, question five and so on. I mean, it takes you some, some knowledge to find out where things are happening uh, formally, and then uh, the informal things around those things take, take another step. And <coughs> a second thing, which is also kind of goes through all these organizations, in my view, is that, and it's also mentioned in the paper, that the so-called distinction between technical issues and technical decisions and political or economical or social or whatever is getting blurred. And, and, and uh, uh, many of those uh, uh, institutions argue that they are merely or more or less merely technical institutions. This might be true, but those technical decisions that they take have have global uh, 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 social, economical, and political uh, consequences. And normally, if you, if you take the ITU, or maybe or also if you take ICANN and other in institutions, you have representatives that are technical experts most of the time who take those decisions. If you take the ITU, and, and, and you, it's normally not, not, not uh, uh, human rights people who, who, who uh, participate in ITU meetings, but it's, it's, telecom, uh, it's the telecom ministries or, or whatever they are called. And so, uh, it's also a problem for, for the, the stakeholders to, to get themselves organized to, 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 to find out what are the right people to participate and, and, and to, to, to kind of, all the stakeholders have to improve their internal procedures also to be able to follow those things because it's, it's less and less clear where, what, where the kind of really technical decisions are taken, uh, being taken and where the political implications are being discussed or are not being discussed that should be discussed. Thank you. Absolutely. I think it's a really key point. And it's not a new point. If one looks at, at broadcasting regulation, for example, something like spectrum allocation, highly complex and technical, and yet with very clear public public policy um, implications. So I think it's a very valid point. You can't hide behind the technical um, complexity. Um, Paul, you wanted to respond. Yeah, I, uh, from uh, the point of view of the, the regional internet registries, we're, we're a good example of bodies within that are solidly within the na narrow definition of internet governance. And it's true that there's quite a lot of, of variety across these organizations. But um, the one common thing, I think, uh, across many, most, or all of them is that we do uh, have origins in an ethos of, of openness, of uh, individual responsibility, uh, of open access and free access to, to information, which is, which is solidly part of the, um, the, the ethos, as, I, as I've said, and I think can be, uh, can be tied to, this, to the very success of the internet itself, um, almost, uh, almost as a parallel to the, to the architecture of the network, uh, which, as we all know, is an, is an open uh, and, and transparent architecture in a technical sense. But uh, I did uh, mention before that um, the processes that we have are under, are under constant evolution. So I think it's always true to say that, uh, that uh, the processes could be improved. Uh, we have a policy development process. The policy development process itself is a subject of policy development. And uh, across all five of the RIRs, you, you can find all the details online, but you would find that across all five of them within the last couple of years, each one would certainly have made adjustments through its open processes to those open processes. So we are, we are actually, I would say, uh, within, our, within our stakeholder communities, we are uh, in many ways our harshest critics. And, uh, and it is from internal uh, self-review that many developments have happened over the past 10 years that have, that have really uh, responded to identified needs and, and improved on the openness and, and access and participation to our um, to our, uh, our to those processes. Um, another point uh, within the narrow the narrow sphere is a body called the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, and it's a it is a very large uh, policy uh, a technical development forum, uh, larger than anything that we're seeing in Hyderabad this week, and it happens three times a year, not as a not as a major flagship event with a lot of uh, a lot of um, um, fanfare, but as a routine, regular event, and that is a highly technical um, uh, forum, and it's one which, which is probably the, the, the best context in which to think about the difference between technical and non-technical um, uh, factors in, in, uh, in internet policy development, and I think uh, 
the challenge of the IETF is, is a very big one in the first place. Whether or not it's, it's their responsibility to become more and more open and accessible uh, is, another, is another question. They're certainly open, but the, the efforts to which they need to go or should be expected to go to translate their detailed technical deliberations into something more digestible for the rest of us, I think, is a real, is a real important question. But it's, uh, I would say that this is a role that other organisations play. So the, uh, the Internet Society, for one, is actually very active in interfacing between the work of the, of the IETF and the rest of us uh, mere mortals uh, in, the internet, in the Internet world. Thanks. Um, my next question was actually going to ask the institutions here to tell us a bit about how, how they address this challenge of um, facilitating participation. And, and, and Paul, you told us a little bit about how the NROs do that. Um, Thomas, do you want to tell us a bit about how you do that at a national level? How you facilitate um, participation, transparency, and access to information? With regard to, to our citizens, to our people. Uh, to your, your primary stakeholders. And it might be yeah. worth also saying who you identify your primary stakeholders to be. Basically, uh, our, uh, our stakeholders that, that uh, uh, we work with directly are, are the, the, the tele uh, telecom operators on the one hand and uh, the media, uh, the electronic media like radio and television on the other hand. And of course, there's all the civil society that cares about media freedom and, and, and privacy and, and and uh, the, uh, whoever, and, and, and sin since um, we, we, are, we have a direct democracy, anybody in Switzerland uh, that does not like something or, uh, or would like to change something can kind of challenge us by, by proposing a new uh, part of the constitution or change of a law or anything. So we are quite directly also controlled by, by, by the, the parliament and by, by the, the, uh, the general public. So we are, we are uh, more or less forced to permanently explain what we are doing to those people because otherwise they will, would, would break us, uh, stop us more or less immediately if, if they wouldn't like it. Um, but of course we have also, uh, an, uh, for instance, with, with regard to the VCs, we have already in 2003, we installed a multi-stakeholder uh, uh, platform uh, for discussion of, of, of well, we had discussions on the VCs document, but now we have discussions on the implementation. We have a, an informal exchange. So, um, and, and, and we, are, we also had, uh, uh, in the first WCS phase, we had business and civil society members in the delegation, and we realized that that was problematic for us, but for them as well, and then we, we started to split again for the second phase, because they were more free, and, and we, we, were, we thought that we were stronger when we were clear to the separate roles that we had, but we had daily meetings and, and constant I interchange, and, and actually was a very interesting experience. What, what, how multi-stakeholder kind of exchange and decision making works and how it doesn't work uh, in this regard. Not so much for the moment. I think yeah, that's enough. We, we also want to give you an opportunity to respond. And uh, what about ISOC? Well, ISOC, uh, as Paul pointed out, is, was initially established uh, to uh, act in the interests of preserving and expanding the internet but also to serve as a home for the IETF and uh, the Internet Engineering Task Force and the Internet Architecture Board. Um, so we have quite a large mandate in terms of providing uh, the resources to make sure and the logistical support to make those things happen. Uh, we are a membership, we're, we're a cause-based uh, organization with membership is how we characterize ourselves. We have a very large global membership of about 18, thousand people. We have 90-odd chapters, which are pretty much autonomous. And, and would you consider those members your primary stakeholders? We don't re I mean, they're, they're our primary supporters in the sense that they, uh, they provide us with local information coming in. Uh, they uh, express the organization's views uh, to which they have input going out. Just let me walk through this a, a bit and we'll get there. Uh, we're governed by a, a board of trustees, which is selected partly by a nomination committee uh, to ensure we have the necessary skills on the board, partly by election by the membership and by uh, corporate uh, members, so there's, there's representation at that level. All of their processes are open except for a very tiny amount of purely business issues. Uh, all the documentation is available in advance, all of the board meetings are open uh, to global participation through the internet uh, or global ob observers.
years. There's not actually, in my experience, much participation, but it is, it is possible. Then there's the staff who work uh, to produce various kind of, of outputs. We have a significant part of membership uh, support and so on. As to the openness to information, I think we're extremely open. On the consultation front, I'd, I'd agree with Paul. It's a very self-critical organization. Uh, you know, we do consult regularly with the members. Uh, we t take input from them in preparing uh, our position papers and so on. So we're consultative, we're open in that sense. On the other hand, uh, it's a, a really a work in progress. We've, we've uh, had a very large process called the Sphere Project going for a couple of years now uh, where we hired a consultant to do a, a huge amount of work studying how the interrelationship is, wor is working between the chapters and the, the core organization, if I can call it that. And uh, it's now working through a series of recommendations and, and uh, pilot projects to actually improve all of that so that we, uh, we can genuinely say that we're an open, transparent uh, body. I wouldn't say we're there yet. I'd probably say that in 10 years as well. It's actually interesting that that will will Ofcom and ISOC referring to internal learning and, and and perhaps when we're looking at sharing of information in this process, there might in fact be quite a lot of, of information out there already that that can be shared. And what about ICANN and what are your primary mechanisms? Well, basically, as Paul was mentioning, um, ICANN was born out of an environment where the the basic attitude was a participatory one because people had only to gain from different input, because it was a scientific endeavor, so the, the richness of ideas of different perspectives was only beneficial. It, it wasn't seen as something controversial. So basically, ICANN um, reflects uh, I I at two levels this, this endeavor to be open. First, at the structural level, ICANN, as, as Thomas was referring to as a very complex organization, um, as different um, supporting organizations and advisory bodies um, which are completely open to participation to anyone who's interested. And the, this supporting organization and advisory body try to group the different stakeholders in homogeneous groups. So we have the three supporting organizations that are the numbering organization, the country code top level domain uh, names uh, managers, and the generic top level domain registries, which are basically the, the people that actually administer the resources. Then there are a number of advisory bodies that represent the rest of the scientific community. So there's the community that deals with the root zone management, the community of security related um, issues, the GAC, the Government Advisory Committee, which is comprised of governments. There are actually 100 out of the more or less 200 governments that are currently involved in international uh, organization. Um, and this is, at, and that uh, last but not least, um, the ALAC, the At Large Advisory Committee, which is the group of uh, civil society representatives that is al also part of this, of this structure. The second level of openness is through processes. Again, like the, the um, addressing organization, the policy development process in ICANN is completely open to outside input. Um, there are a number of steps that I, I won't uh, go into uh, details here that are open to public consultation online. So each policy is developed through the input that comes from the community in quite, quite a long process. It might take up to two, three, four years just to be sure that everyone has had the chance to intervene in the making of this. And finally, the effort, as all the other organizations pointed out, is also to be always uh, up to speed with the different needs of the organization, of the community. And so ICANN has, in its bylaws, every three years, the obligation to go through an overview, or a review process of all these structures to see if they are still fit for the purpose that were designed for. And, and who would you say are your primary stakeholders? Well, basically, uh, the number supporting organization, the country code top level domain, the generic top level domain names, and civil society, plus the technical community, which is represented in the various support.
course you will. Yeah. So advisory board. Um, thanks um, to all of that. I want to open the floor a bit and, and, and invite um, invite members of the audience. Um, taking all of this information, um, and I think clearly there's there's the narrow. You know, we talk about defining internet governance broadly, but often when we end up talking about specific mechanisms, it seems to me they sound as if they're actually addressing the narrow definition rather than the broad definition. But opening to all of you and to the panelists, what would you say are in fact the challenges? I mean, uh, um, assuming that we all agree with Thomas's point that it can be improved and, and there's always room for improvement um, in internet governance, what are the, the um, primary challenges in, in ensuring or barriers against ensuring greater transparency and public participation and access information? Anyone from the audience who, who, who want to, to comment on that? Independent person here. I'm not representing anybody can you, can you hold the microphone a bit closer well, I'm to not representing anybody but myself. Um, I'm an open software enthusiast and I'm currently working on a wiki-like direct democratic online decision-taking application. That's a mouthful, sorry. Um, my work uh, on this as of yet is completely independent and self-funded. Um, my question. I see that some key values that are uh, being uh, discussed here are transparency, full participation, a wide range of stakeholders, open access, efficiency, uh, low barrier entry, self-governing. Um, I see also this main obstacle uh, being mentioned by a few of you guys on uh, like uh, the distributed nature of the problem. I think this is definitely a key obstacle. Um, I, I do see also right now that the process f for me as an as a independent sort of outsider is not very transparent, efficient, easy entry and, and not very self-governing. Uh, to me, it's actually quite logic, like sort of an, 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 an sort of an answer. Like you, you're governing the internet, why not use the internet much more to solve this problem? Try to make an application like what I'm kind of working on, <laughs> to 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 take this whole process online, so I can read all your guys' discussions and I can see all the inputs of all these things happening. Uh, an online voting process or anything like they're doing it everywhere right now. Maybe I'm stating the obvious. But I, I don't really see it in, 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 in IG, or is, is there something that I'm missing? There is. <laughs> Please, enlighten me. And also from the Remote Participation Working Group, which is a group that was put together at the beginning of this year with a common concern to enhance remote participation at the IGF. We have been working with two main axes, one of them to test different platforms of interactions such as Illuminate, Dim Dim and Singularity. And actually Dim Dim was chosen by us and the Secretariat to be the platform this year because of financial and technical reasons. And the other X, we have been studying uh, models of remote participation that are putting forward by other meetings. And we, we were very, it called our attention, the model that has been put forth by the AIDS International Conference, which is based on hubs. So uh, from this study, we got in touch with uh, local communities and local groups to organize hubs to the IGF. Uh, the hubs, these hubs are taking place right now. And there are local meetings where people are able to watch the webcast of the IGF and also uh, participate not only in the main sessions, but also in the parallel session and workshops and sending questions and text messages and sometimes video if they uh, have the technology to do so. And uh, uh, we, we didn't want to, to compete with other projects. So since from the start, we had a very practical approach to this issue. We didn't want to be like theoretical about remote participation, but we wanted, just wanted to propose a solution. And it, I think it's important to emphasize that it's a group of internet users, ordinary internet users. We don't have like, a big organization behind us and just answering to your questions, I think one of the big issues to, to, to put forth remote participation is that uh, it, it's difficult to get your voice through. I mean, we, we have been working during a whole year and only in the last minute we got the support from the, the official bureaucracy and from the secretariat, which I, by the way, thank very much for their support because it would not be possible without them. But it's really difficult. We don't know what's going on. I didn't, I didn't know. Uh, I was uh, happy to see this panel, but I didn't know it was being organized. So we are working, you are working, and we are not in touch. 
And I just wanted to say that it's a very good idea to put together this code um, that we're proposing because I, f I feel that from year to year, we like, we, we start from ground zero again. We don't have benchmarks and it would be really important for us to have. And I just wanted to, to ask, a uh, just by curiosity, I know that you have been talking about the Aris Convention um, and I think that another very interesting um, process is the European process because since the, the white book um, of uh, internet of governance, European governance, they have established some guidelines for the participation and the European uh, Commission, it has to, to give answers to the people who participate in the interactive policy making. And I think that is something that lacks in internet governance. I know that ICANN has a, a, a very good way of participation that you can really interact through the, 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 the homepage. You have like this kind of mechanism, but you don't have to answer to the, to the participants. So he doesn't feel like he has a feedback. And I think this, the European community put forth, it could be very interesting. So you know that your participation is being valued by the organization. Thank you. So reactions from the panel, the point.